in community, in education, and in politics, on campus, and across the world. Christ in everything. You're listening to Cedar 60. Hi there, and welcome back to Cedar 60. My name's Johnny Gartner. Thanks for joining us. With me today is Dr. Justin D. Lyons, Associate Professor of Political Science here at Cedarville. Dr. Lyons, whose PhD is in politics from the Institute of Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas, has taught courses on ancient and modern political thought, Winston Churchill, and ancient medieval and military history. In addition to numerous articles and book reviews on Winston Churchill, he is the author of Alexander the Great and the Hernan Cortez, Ambiguous Legacies of Leadership. Dr. Lyons, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So Cedar 60, we're really interested in talking about how Christians can be engaged in culture and politics while simultaneously being effective gospel witnesses. And for this week's episode, given your background, I kind of wanted to discuss maybe what exactly is politics from a philosophical standpoint and how Christians can be involved on that basis. So for the first question, maybe just as a generally broad question, what is politics? Well, uh, as you said, given my background, I'm going to take you into the ancient world, first of all. Okay. And and to the writings of Aristotle. So, first of all, you need to know that the primary political form in ancient Greece is called the polis, which just means city. Uh, So, that's the highest form of political organization for the Greeks. And sometimes it's translated as city-state to indicate that. So politics actually comes from polis. Politics is the activity of the polis, of the city, just as athletics is the activity of the athlete. So that's the first thing politics is. It's what the city does, right? And what the city does is, of course, try to provide for its citizens in all the normal ways we would think of. But beyond that, in the ancient Greek conception, especially in the Aristotelian conception, It's to allow for the fulfillment of human nature, to allow human beings to achieve their end. So you can see right off that the ancient definition of politics is rather more comprehensive than more modern definitions of politics. So it's what the city does. Now, the other thing that I often say in class is, what is politics? Politics is conflict. Because politics is a running disagreement among the members of a civil society as to what they ought to do, you know, about a variety of questions. What should the laws look like? What should the shape of the regime be? What degree of liberty or control should be in effect? What should the distribution of material resources look like? And about all of these things, human beings will disagree. So it is conflict, it is argument. Now it's supposed to be, it's meant to be controlled conflict. It's undertaken on the level of discussion and persuasion rather than physical violence. So it's meant to be a turn away from settling our disputes by tooth and claw or club and sword to more civilized fashion of of speaking and persuading our fellow citizens to our point of view. So that's a pretty broad view of what politics is. And for the ancients, it's also, it's much more than simply voting behavior, right? It's, it's everything about human life that has to do with living together with one another. So, yeah, you were talking about um, that uh, discussion was vital to politics. So you'd fair to say that put it maybe on the exchange of ideas is critical to politics, the body of politics as general, even as right, people. Because, because Aristotle says man is a political animal in right. his politics. And the primary indicator of that for him is that we are the beings with logos, that is to say reason or speech. So politics is the realm which allows our logos uh, to have its full play, reasoning, discussing, persuading. 
And you mentioned that that's different than maybe like our modern understanding of politics or certainly the way that it's practiced. You mentioned it's more than just voting habits. So there's a whole other body of political study, political science. Can you explain the difference between this kind of explanation that you just gave and what political science is? Uh, yes, I think. <laughs> I will try, that is to say. So political philosophy, to start there, is born with Socrates. So it is, first of all, to be contrasted with pre-Socratic philosophy, where people were interested in things like uh, what is the foundational element of the universe, metaphysical questions primarily. So Socrates is said to have brought philosophy down into the city, that is to say, he made philosophy concerned with the human things, how human beings live their lives, how they can live together, uh, how they pursue justice, uh, equitable distribution, things like that. So political and political philosophy indicates sorts of things that are being investigated. And philosophy or philosophic indicates the manner in which they are investigated. And it's a comprehensive investigation then getting down to the root of things. That's the philosophy aspect. And so the study of politics in this way is very old, and it goes back to Herodotus. And Herodotus investigated various regimes. Now, the point of that was comparative, to see who did politics best, or who did it well and who didn't do it well, so that you could adopt what was good and reject what was bad. So that's continued with the political philosophers, primarily in the Greeks, uh, Socrates, then his student Plato, then the student Xenophon, and then Aristotle. So the point of political philosophy is to search for the best way of doing things politically, or so to speak, the best regime. Now regime, has two meanings in Aristotle, or it's defined twice, you could say, in the politics. First of all, it's simply the ordering of offices. You're gonna have a king, you're gonna have a senate, you're gonna have assembly. What does that look like constitutionally speaking? The second thing the regime means is the way of life of the city. So it's the search for the best way of life for human beings, both in terms of organization and in terms of what they are pursuing. That's what political philosophy is after. Political science tends to be far more limited in what it is after. Now for the birth of political science, as we understand it, modern political science, you go back to the enlightenment, which is in, in which period you see the birth of the social sciences. Now the social sciences spring from a desire to have about the human thing a sure and certain knowledge, which is analogous to the sure and certain knowledge that one achieves in the natural sciences, right? So physics tells you exactly how things work. You know, you have clear answer, gravity works this way. You know what the rate of acceleration is. You know all of those things. So wouldn't it be nice to have that sort of exacting knowledge about the human things? It would simplify human life a great deal. So first of all, it's an attempt to achieve certain knowledge as one has in the, in the natural sciences. That, of course, uh, will involve viewing human activity in a certain way and viewing human nature in a certain way. So the first thing you have to do is get rid of anything that complicates that investigation. And what complicates that investigation is the idea of the human soul and free will and things like this, right? So we have to simplify man in order to simplify human behavior. The idea is that if we can understand human beings in the same way we would understand rocks and trees or lawnmowers even. So if we have the owner's manual, you know exactly what human beings are gonna do in a given situation, and therefore we can better target our laws and our regulations in order to achieve desired result. Now, so I, I think from my point of view and from, I believe, the Christian point of view, that's a misstep, right? Because it tends to make man a sort of cog in a mechanistic universe, 
rather than someone with a soul in a moral universe, in God's universe. Now, where I think political science really gets into trouble, however, begins in the 19th century with the rise of what we call social science positivism. And that says that there's a fundamental distinction between facts and values. So the fact value distinction. And only factual judgments lie within the competence of science. So therefore, a scientific social science would also be unable to produce value judgments. It's value-free or ethically neutral. And political science largely follows those trends. By the 20th century, it becomes dominated by behavioralism, that is, um, the study of behavior apart from motivation. Now, the problem with that is that to the extent modern political science has adopted a value-free approach, it's abandoned the purpose or the original purpose of political investigation because political philosophy depends on its ability to make judgments. If you're searching for the best regime, you have to have access to the categories, to the categories of good and bad, better and worse in order to make those judgments. So the value-free or ethically neutral portion of political science is in conflict with political philosophy, which is on a quest for the good, or the good, or the best political order. So could you give like an example, say maybe what a modern political scientist or political philosopher would be doing compared to what according to what you've just explained, what the ideal political scientist or philosopher should be doing? Yeah, well, um, I don't know that there are any, there are many anyway, modern political philosophers. Political philosophy sort of belongs to an earlier age because lots of things have happened to make it difficult, certainly from the point of view of modern political science, problematic or even impossible, right? So there's a denial, generally speaking, in the academy among political scientists that political philosophy has anything relevant to say, right? But let me try to take this example. Much of political science and other forms of uh, social science are dominated um, by something called rational choice theory. Now, that's complicated to explain, but you can boil it down to the idea, the presupposition that people always act rationally in their own self-interest, okay? So that's a simplification of human behavior that is aimed at making their behavior predictable and therefore treatable in terms of laws and regulations and so forth, right? But I think in my point of view, from my point of view, only a moment's reflection will tell you that human beings in fact don't always act rationally in their own self-interest. So it's a simplification of human behavior like a model in, uh, in natural science. The model is not the thing itself, it's a simplification of the thing itself so that it could be better handled, say, under laboratory conditions. A political philosopher would say, well, that's a false picture of humanity. We have to look at human beings as they are in all their complexity. They have a soul, they have free will, they act irrationally on the basis of passion or the desire for revenge or even just wickedness. Right, so both self-sacrifice, the person uh, throwing himself on the grenade to save his fellows, right? Uh, rational choice theory has problems with those moments. Political philosophy can incorporate those into the study of what human beings are and all their complexity. Yeah, so you, you alluded to this in that answer, but um, political science can be at odds with Christianity, as you just explained. So are there political scientists or philosophers who have researched or written or discussed these ideas? And if so, what have they talked about? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say I don't mean to throw all political scientists under the bus here. <laughs> political science uh, is something can be viewed uh, from a variety of perspectives. As well, there are lots of political scientists who are not anti-Christian or anti, they're not atheists or, or anti-religion or any of those things. They simply, they're, they are acquiring political data, right? 
taking what measurements are out there, like voting behavior, polling data, and all of those things. There's nothing wrong with those activities at all, right? And uh, you don't necessarily have to buy in the fact value distinction to undertake any of those activities, right? So I was trying to speak in very broad terms about political science and how it basically takes uh, in various ways a different approach to political philosophy. And one of those ways is simply that it's much narrower in its focus. Okay, so uh, voting behavior, as we talked about, or polling data, those things which, those human behaviors which are explicitly political, it's what political scientists, modern political scientists are interested in. A political philosopher is going to be interested in a great deal more than that. Because in order to understand politics or human society adequately, the political philosopher would say, you have to understand human beings adequately. And that means, uh, among other things, what is their place in the universe? What is their relationship to each other? What is their relationship to the divine? What is the relationship to the cosmos? So in that way of looking at things, uh, the number of subjects that fall under political inquiry is greatly expanded. One might even say infinitely expanded because one, has, one is concerned with everything that man knows or thinks he knows about the universe because those things affect his relationship with other human beings, that is, politics. So there, there is a body of literature out there in which people uh, discuss the differences between political philosophy and political science. But I do have to say that the battle has, it's an unequal contest and the battle has largely been won by political science. Political philosophy still exists, uh, but it doesn't have anything near the popularity in academic departments as mainline political science. Um, you find it in certain universities, and often under the category of, or the name of political theory, which of course relegates it to irrelevance in an age of scientific pragmatism, uh, or the more noble political thought, but often, even if it's allowed, it's allowed, it's viewed as a, as a, as a matter of antiquarian interest rather than a, uh, a course of study that has anything relevant to say to us in the here and now. Yeah, so um, thinking about kind of what you just talked about, you kind of mentioned that political philosophy is going down, you know, kind of going down the drain as the political science takes over, but there's still a lot of ancient political philosophy that can be referenced. But I think a lot of those ancient writers would probably not have believed in God. So how do we as Christians approach study, approach studying those writers and what they have to say? Because we probably believe that it's definitely worth investigating. How do we investigate those and um, reconcile it with our faith? Yeah. So, yeah, you're right to say, of course, we have, all, we have these old books. <laughs> uh, much has been lost to us over the centuries, but we do have uh, certain extremely important books, the works of Plato and Aristotle, for example. Uh, among Christian political philosophers, you would include people like Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, right? But when I teach political thought here at Cedarville, of course, I have to lead the students through a pretty alien landscape uh, in terms of, say, ancient Greek thinkers who are, of course, pagans. Uh, if they believe in gods, they don't believe in the god in which we believe. That they did not have special revelation. But it's important to point out that they did have general revelation. So, um, Romans chapter 1 along with the, what we'd call the natural law understanding, says there's in fact a great deal that you can figure out about the universe and about its creator by virtue of being a rational creature in that universe. So I think it's misguided whenever Christians say we shouldn't read pagan thinkers like Plato and Aristotle. So I think... Uh, the emphasis should not be on what they got wrong or didn't get correct, I suppose, is better. 
but on what they got right, right? So what, what, did they, what did they figure out by virtue of being a very smart person, a rational creature in God's universe? And it turns out to be a very great deal indeed. So I think you find actually a great deal with an ancient pagan political philosophy that is in very close accord or agreement with the Christian faith. And I'll reference as a support to that, Thomas Aquinas, the great 13th century thinker, uh, the scholastic, who was attempting, among other things, to combine Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology. And most of the time, he found that a pretty easy job. They're, they're pretty well in line. So let me try to give at least one example that I use in my History of Political Thought one course. So you find in Aristotle, for example, that he says in the politics that the wickedness of human beings is insatiable and the nature of desire is without limit. You find another of biblical verses that would back up those concepts, of course. So what we see is Aristotle is reflecting on human beings from what he sees around him. And while he does not have access to the doctrine of original sin, he very clearly sees its symptoms. Right? He sees how human beings act. He sees that they tend to be selfish and corrupt and oppress other people. They tend to be passionate rather than rational. All of those things which make a uh, human political community very problematic. And he goes on to say, in essence, that, that uh, a reasonable political regime or approach and has to take that reality into effect. So there we find him in close accord. He doesn't say it's original sin, but he, the, the effect is the same. He sees the, he sees the symptoms, even if he doesn't know the root cause, right? So we find ourselves in agreement with Aristotle on that point. Indeed, I think on many other points as well. So as Christians taking our uh, belief in what you mentioned as the fallen nature of man and as Aristotle pointed out the symptoms of those things. How do we enter our role in that political arena as you mentioned which is the job of most citizens? How do we enter that role and effectively use the resources of the political philosophy like you've taught just talked about and also uh, be effective gospel witnesses in not just, you know, walking into Congress and preaching the gospel, but just in general role as citizens. Uh, well, of course, a uh, citizen varies according to regime. So we talked about regime. Regime is a word that sounds pretty negative to our modern ears, right? We think of tyrannies and so forth, but uh, it's not that to the Greeks. It simply means the ordering of offices, the way of life, as I said, and it could be good or bad. And Aristotle says there are good and bad regimes. Of course, we're on the quest for the best regime, or at least as good of regime as we can get. So uh, citizen means different things at different times. In modern America, of course, citizen means we have the opportunity to speak into political affairs to a far greater extent than has been generally true politically and even perhaps is generally true in the contemporary world, right? So uh, how do we apply political philosophy as Christians to politics? First of all, I guess we'd say it informs us about how politics works. What are the alternatives in politics? So Aristotle spends a great deal of time talking about various political approaches that have been taken. Now that gives us access to the experience of the ages, right? What has been tried, what has worked and what has not worked. So we can of course take that information in our own evaluations of say public policy recommendations that are put before us now and say, well, look, that was tried in ancient Athens or in Cuba or in China or wherever, and it doesn't work. And, but in, in a deeper way, it doesn't work uh, not just on a sort of facile, it doesn't have a good, say, economic um, outcome, but it doesn't work because of the way human beings are. Right? There's something about 
about this policy that isn't in accord with reality. So that gives us a deeper reflection on these things. I think it's always of value to be as deeply informed about these things as one can be. So uh, the ancients certainly give you that. Uh, but of course, then there were also Christian thinkers. A lot of them talk, talk, thought and wrote about political matters. And whether we, in the end, agree with them and everything doctrinally, they are people who share our faith um, and who are trying to make sense of human life in a fallen world and trying to live as they should as Christians, both individually and collectively. So what are ways in which Christians can speak into politics are very often dealt with say, for example, in the medieval thinkers, uh, particularly uh, Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, who wrote, of course, The City of God, um, among other things, right? Now, I, I, I'd say there are sort of two to sort of basic approaches here to the, to the Christian and politics that stem from two thinkers. I'm simplifying things a good bit, but uh, from Augustine and Aquinas, say. So for Augustine, politics seems to be really a result of sin. Um, God gives man authority over the beasts in Genesis. He doesn't give man authority over his fellow men, which means politics is not a part of the original creative plan. And Augustine says where this domination of man over man enters in is when sin, sin enters into the picture. So in that view of politics, politics becomes a kind of necessary evil. It does good things, like as in Romans 13, it restrains evildoers. But it's not therefore necessarily to be celebrated for Augustine. Right? It, it has to be there. It has to be done, but that doesn't make it a good in itself for Augustine. So his view of politics is, in large part, it's certainly not the most important thing. Uh, it's important, yes, but it's not the most important thing. Uh, and even suggests in The City of God, he says, he writes, um, what does it matter, the regime under which you live, so long as it allows you to worship God in peace? So... This is not a person who's probably going to be mobilizing people to get out the vote. <laughs> you know, if you could rip him out of his historical context and put, it, put him in our own. Right? Now, but the other, the other view that I was going to get to is stems from Aquinas, who was, of course, very much influenced by Aristotle. So for Aristotle, and therefore for Aquinas, politics is in fact natural. It's part of our natures and not just part of our fallen natures, but as our natures as they come from God, pre-fall. That God put, us, put in us a social impulse, a social or political impulse that we're supposed to, not only we're supposed to, and we need to live together and fulfill, to fulfill our natures. Therefore, nature, politics is natural to us. If society is natural, then governance is natural. Aquinas makes that case. So therefore, politics turns out to be more of a good thing. So, but those are two sort of competing, I, I guess you would say, uh, or tension views that are coming into, coming out of Christian outlook in politics. So I think it's fair to say, going back from what you talked about at the beginning of the polis and the regime and, you know, looking to build better society, that we understand as Christians that people are sinful and broken and that even government can't solve the problems and that our chief end is to bring glory to God and help bring others to the glory of God. And we can achieve that using political philosophy. Would you agree with that? Uh, well, political philosophy is not the same thing as political activity. So it's a form of studying political things. Okay. One could then take the knowledge one has acquired and translate it into political activity um, in, you know, in terms of shaping laws or shaping the regime uh, or things like that. Yeah, but primarily it's, it's a way of studying political things. One then takes that study and, and translates it into political action. 
So would you say it's important for people to study the history of political thought as participating in not just American government, but just as participating in society as a whole? Absolutely. I mean, um, so if we if we are people who think the study of political things is important, say as contemporary Americans, we tend to think of it in terms of studying the American Constitution or constitutional law, right? And all those things are important, and they of course have an immediate importance for us. And then this is the re- regime by which we are governed, and the laws by which we are governed, and we can attempt to influence those one way or another. But uh, political philosophy is also valuable, I would argue, because it allows us to see outside of or around the regime in which we live. So we can become sort of just so focused on our particular regime that we're no longer able to adequately see or measure its flaws. And when that happens, we're no longer adequately able to guide it towards overcoming those flaws. So if you understand the alternatives, the political alternatives that are out there, I would say you're in a better position to understand political things and in a better position to guide your own regime over the difficult ground of self-overcoming sometimes. Because no regime, no constitution, including ours, is perfect, nor is it immortal. So um, political philosophy gives you that larger perspective, just as the study of history gives you a larger perspective on human existence that is richer than our own individual experiences. And it's fair to say that because of the unique um, belief we hold as Christians in the inevitability of that failure and of sin, we are also um, the only ones who can apply those beliefs into the practice of governments and philosophy politics, correct? Yeah. In so f- Christianity knows where the world is going, right? And it knows what the, the end of things is. It knows, it knows what the purpose of all things is. Um, so if you have that knowledge, <laughs> you're in a far better position to understand the flow of particulars as they, you know, pass in front of your nose. So you're not Political philosophy and Christianity share this. They're not captured by the present. The present is not all important. It has a larger perspective uh, and obviously uh, a richer perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. Well, Dr. Lyons, I'm going to give you the last 60 seconds. If you have anything on the topic, you can say that. I won't pose a question. I'll just give you the floor for 60 seconds. So if you have something to say, go for it. Um, well, well, let me encourage all the students out there uh, to take political thought. <laughs> we, in our department, we have two courses currently on political thought, but we offer a number of seminars. And... Uh, Uh, The department here at Cedarville is very strong on American politics and constitutional law and all those things. And all those things are great and they're extremely important for our students to know and understand, obviously. But uh, this is another important aspect of things that students ought to study. And also just in terms of being a Christian in politics uh, or affecting politics, right? the first and foremost thing is to live out publicly our identity in Christ in a way that brings honor and glory and recognition to God the Father. Right? So that's the best witness we can have in political things. And we often get, I think, too caught up with this particular administration, this particular court decision, this particular law, And we lose sight of the fact that all of this is in the hands of God. Yeah, perfect. Well, Dr. Lyons, thank you for joining us today. This was a really thought-provoking and fascinating discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cedar 60. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.